Sharon Stone was walking down the road in 2001. She was a famous actress. She thought that somebody had attacked her and shot her in the head. She collapsed on the floor, was rushed to hospital, was actually treated for a ruptured brain aneurysm. Basically a third of the people will die pretty much straight away. A third that will survive, another third that will need uh, treatment for the rest of their lives. An entrepreneur or a, or a founder is, is very enthusiastic about what they do. They'll often blind people with science. You gave me the ability to, to kind of stand back from that and see it from the other person's perspective. Hello, Mike. Hi, Beth. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, too. Thank you so much for coming and um, talking to me. I'm really interested to hear uh, about your story mm -hmm. uh, about endovascular, basically what you did before and how you started the company, um, what it is you'd like to have happen with the company, where are you right now with it, and where, where do you see it going in the future? Great. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks yeah. for asking me along. It's my pleasure. So, um, so just tell me, you know, sort of your role in the company and mm. where you started. Yeah. So, so I am the CEO of Oxford Endovascular. It's a company that's a spin out from the University of Oxford, and we're developing a technology to prevent brain hemorrhage or ruptures of blood vessels in the in the brain. Basically, um, I I've been interested in the area of medicine going back to when I was at school. I initially studied preclinical medicine. I wanted to be a doctor. And this was back in the 1980s, mid 80s. And um, after a few years of studying, I realized that I would probably end up as a tiny little cog in a great big engine, uh, bearing in mind what was going on with the healthcare system in the UK at that at that time. And I thought, well, what's the best way for me to, to have some sort of major effect on uh, how things are done or treatments etc and it was a kind of a turning point in my life I decided to go to the dark side as some people say <laughs> and to go to go into industry um, and I started in the pharma industry for about five years and then got a great opportunity to get into medical devices or, or medical technology so that was the big big turning point and I've been in that environment for probably 25 to 30 years. Now, for 25 or 30 years? S something like developing that. Developing medical devices. Yeah, um, I'm not an engineer by background. I'm not, not that clever. Uh, my late father was an engineer. But um, I really built my expertise on the commercial side of the businesses and learned to essentially work with startup type organizations. Even the big companies I worked with were units where they had startups and that's what really excited me mm. seeing something go from it, from in inception getting it to the market and then seeing it in the hands of different types of doctors and seeing how it performed with patients to change lives so is is, is then uh, endovascular is this company oxford endovascular mm. your first startup that you've been involved with or? so this is it's my third major startup if if you like um, but I guess what's unique about it is I've been there right from the beginning or even before the beginning because it was it was an invention uh, that was in Oxford University. It had a little bit of grant funding behind it, um, but it needed the money raised to form a company, build a team and then take something essentially from the bench and turn it into something which could be truly commercialized? Well, I mean, I've worked with um, TNO in, in, the, in the Netherlands and a number of um, organizations that are, their focus is in developing technology, doing mm. the research, but they want to commercialize it. And mm. it's really hard to shift researchers and scientists' work or projects mm. to the commercial environment. And so what you're doing with uh, sort of at, at Oxford, um, where you're taking something from the bench and bringing it to the market, and then mm. you've done this a couple times before, it sounds like, is something that should be in very high demand, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the key thing, there are lots of fantastic inventions in many different universities, right. but, but often the key thing is, is there a real need for that? Has that been validated? So I guess where I came into this story was... Oxford University approached me that 
heard a little bit about what I'd done over the years, and they said, will you come in and have a look at the technology, meet the inventors, and, and, and tell us if there's a market for this, and tell us what you think. We, we've heard that there is, but uh, we don't really know how that's defined. So, so that was an opportunity for, for me to come in, have a look at what they were really talking about. And how long ago was that? <clears throat> so that was uh, about four years ago, in mm -hmm. fact. So we've been, we've been going for two and a half years mm -hmm. now. So effectively, for a year and a half, I was looking at this, um, building the case for this, and going out and working to get investors on, on board once I'd started to, to really believe in it and think, well, this could really be life-changing for not just for the patients, but for many others, investors included. Yeah. So could you explain a little bit about what the technology is? How does it work? Mm -hmm. So and what's the, currently on the available yeah, versus what sure. you Yeah, sure. I'll give you a, a picture of, of the marketplace. So we're dealing with an issue uh, called brain aneurysms, which are weaknesses in the blood vessels in the brain that at any point could rupture and burst. Some people listening to this have probably heard of many situations where this has happened. Most recently, Sir Alex Ferguson, the ex-Manchester United manager, had a ruptured brain aneurysm, totally undetected for, for many years and then suddenly ruptured. Sharon Stone, the famous actress from in 2001, she had a ruptured brain aneurysm and it devastated her life and ended her career. So most people have heard of people or, or in fact know people. I've in literally every week I hear of somebody who I know who has been touched by this this disease and what percentage of them are fatal so um, if it ruptures basically a third of the people will die pretty much straight away and the other two third you'll get a third that will survive and basically uh, another third that will need uh, treatment for the rest of their lives basically to prevent it from rupturing again so if you can catch it before any of that, the idea is that you you can stop it from, from rupturing. Mm -hmm. So if you can catch it, it means you have to know and have some means of seeing yeah, it, right? Yeah. So what's explained? So the amazing thing is that um, there is the technology to identify uh, this. So if, if somebody gave you a scan or me a scan, they'd be able to see whether we had a, a brain aneurysm or not. Bear in mind, one in 50 people have brain aneurysms. So, you know, if you get a big group of people together at a conference, there'll be a significant number that will. The tragedy is that a lot of people just don't know that they have this. Typically, they're found by accident. So they go in for a scan for something else. It could be a soft tissue injury in the shoulder. Because doctors know that, they're, that this is very common, they will look to see if there's an aneurysm there and they'll in the brain, mm -hmm. even though it's a soft yeah, shoulder. Yeah, because yeah, because if they're, if they're doing it, yeah, if they're doing, let's say they're doing an MRI scan or a CT scan, while they're there, they can... Look at your head. Literally mm -hmm. look, at, look at what's there. And so often they will say to the patient, look, we can deal with your shoulder or whatever it is, or your carotid, but you've got something else going on there we need to deal with pretty much straight away. Um, so that's the reality of the situation. Patients are often found um, purely by accident. And finding them by accident actually is a big enough market for companies like ours to be interested in. But it could be even bigger. So there are some countries that have already started to screen at-risk patients for brain aneurysm. And what, how do you define an at-risk patient? Yeah, it's a good question. So if you've got a family history, say, for example, if someone's mother or father has had a brain aneurysm, that person is ten times more likely to have a brain aneurysm. So straight away, one could identify them as a potentially at-risk uh, patient. Wow. Um, sadly, ladies are 10 times more likely to have brain aneurysms than, than men. Hmm. Um, we don't know exactly why. Um, and of course, having cardiovascular disease increases the risk of either normal, normal people who haven't got a history, uh, but can multiply those with a history you know, again, hundreds of folds. Uh, so, so, so just being a woman um, uh, gives you, uh, you're at higher risk of uh, brain aneurysm mm. than a man. So should all women be 
scanned or is it something, I mean, like, what's the higher incidence mm. by a factor of 10, by a factor of four? It's, it's by a factor of 10 for, for, for women. Um, the places that are screening will typically look at, I was in Taiwan recently, just to give you a, an example, um, age group 40 to 60, uh, people with cardiovascular disease or a family history of cardiovascular disease, such as diabetes, something like that, uh, poor diet, etc., smoking. Um, if they're females, as well, on, on, on you know within that, um, you know, they'll they'll break it down and and give a scoring as to whether someone's at risk and to what extent. Um, and that way, you can basically identify the people who should be targeted to look at. That way, when you're doing an MRI, which, yes, it costs a few hundred pounds, so you're not going to do it on every single person mm. straight away, but if you carefully target, you're going to find the vast majority of people who are, who are going to have brain aneurysms. And that way you can, you can then treat them, because there are various forms of treatments around. None of them are ideal, which is why we're here developing something for the future. It is ideal. Uh, <laughs> You know, hopefully, um, but you know, you, you make something and then you want to, con you know, continually improve. Right. Um, but yes, you can identify someone, treat them, and prevent the misery of being permanently disabled. Right, or dying. Or dying. Now, if someone's permanently disabled, that's a massive burden on society and the costs right. of healthcare. So, if you're talking between forty and sixty, you know. This is relatively young right. nowadays. This right. is considered relatively young. Right. And yet this age group is, is at high risk. At high risk yeah. Right. My brother-in-law's father died of a mm. brain aneurysm. I think it was 42. Mm. So, mm. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, it's, it, you say everybody knows someone. It's like I know mm. of someone who's mm. had it happen. Um, yeah. Your... Uh, so, so explain what's currently available mm. and what you are doing that's yeah. that's different, better, yeah. etc. Sure. So historically, the first way that brain aneurysms were treated was through open surgery. So a surgeon would literally open up the skull, delve around to find the weakness in, in the blood vessel, and put a little clip around the base of that weakness and pinch it off, if you like, to stop it filling up with blood and rupturing. That is still done to this day. It's still done in Europe. It's still done in the US. And if you look at China, that's the mainstay of treatment. Um, over the last 30 years or so, uh, with the advent of keyhole surgery, so being able to put tiny little things into people's bodies through little, little holes in the blood vessels, so going into the leg, for example, and getting into the heart or getting into other blood vessels, people started to realize that they could place things higher up and into the neck and into the brain. So literally by making a little keyhole in your leg or groin area, getting into the main blood vessel there, passing up these little tiny tubes called catheters or micro catheters, getting it into the brain. And then they realized, well, if they can get access to that, if they could only put something through that that will get into the aneurysm and do something, then they would have a chance of treating someone without having to open up their right. their skull. So um, the real big... How long ago was that? Yeah, so that was about... Um, people started to, to think of ways of doing that about 30 years or so. So 30. it's actually fairly recent right. time in, in medical technology. Um, the big leap forwards uh, with dealing with aneurysms was some work that was done in California, in fact, um, and in fact, one of our inventors was, was involved in a lot of that, that work. And this was the development of micro coils, so tiny little coils of metal made out of platinum. And these could literally be put in through these micro catheters and dropped into the aneurysm one by one until they literally filled up the aneurysm and blocked the blood from going in. Now, this is all done under live x-ray. So the doctor who's performing this technique is not actually seeing exactly where they're going. They look at an x-ray, which is a moving image, and they have to have a 3D spatial awareness, a bit like flying a helicopter, if you like, inside someone's wow. body. 
and they'll drop these little coils in and they'll fill the aneurysm up and the idea is that that will prevent blood from getting in and if you can prevent the blood from getting in then it, this aneurysm is not going to get bigger uh, and rupture. The big problem is that there are potentially a lot of complications with this as with any interventional procedure. Um, because you're putting something inside the aneurysm, the aneurysm is still effectively there. Mm -hmm. So it, it is potentially at risk of, of bursting. During the procedure itself, um, it's a very delicate procedure and there is a risk of rupture because you're putting a catheter or this tube into the aneurysm first in order to drop these things in. So you can imagine you're dealing with something which is two or three millimeters across and if you're putting a little tube in and you make one slight wrong movement or it's not exactly where you thought it was, it's potential uh, risk. Nevertheless, compared to open surgery, it's got very good success rates and of course you know, the problems with open surgery of being under anaesthetic for that long, risk of, of bleeding on the table, um, long recovery, um, being out of work for a long period of time, it was a big, big step forwards. So now really what has been done is a combination of the two, depending on the situation, where the risk is, where the aneurysm is. Um, but then people started to think, well, you know, some of these, these aneurysms are quite big and these little coils can often fall out of position. So they thought, well, maybe there's a way to stop them from falling out. People had already developed um, devices called stents, so little metallic tubes, that can go into the arteries in the heart and essentially stop people from having a heart attack mm -hmm. whereas historically they would have done open heart surgery so I think a lot of people now have heard of oh I've I had a stent put in yeah. last week and I went back to work and you know I'm good now mm. so applying that concept to um, dealing with uh, blood vessels in the brain people thought well what if I could put one of these stents across the blood vessel that's got the weakness or the aneurysm on it and stop those little coils from falling out, kind of creating a little bridge. Right. So they started to develop smaller and smaller stents that could do that. And that is known as stent assisted coiling. So you're doing two things to deal with a very, very difficult situation. And then after a while they realized, well, if we can get a stent into position to stop something falling out of the aneurysm. What if that stent itself could stop the blood flowing into the aneurysm and putting that aneurysm at risk? So people started to develop the concept of a flow diverter, to divert the flow away from the aneurysm but into the areas where it's needed. And divert the flow of blood. <clears throat> exactly. Um, and they realized that you only have to divert about 30% of the blood flow away from the aneurysm to cause it to start a self-healing process. I mean, our, our bodies are amazing. You know, you can stimulate our bodies to actually treat themselves, if you like, yeah. under certain conditions. So basically, if you divert enough flow away from the aneurysm, you create coagulation in the aneurysm, so the blood goes slow and fills up and kind of creates a blood clot, which stops the aneurysm from getting bigger. And then over time, many months or even a, a year or so, that aneurysm will start to shrink and heal and disappear. Mm. So that created, and this was around 2008, 2009. Sounds like a phenomenal outcome. Yeah, a startup company, a little bit like ours, actually in, in the US at the time, created the world's first flow divert. Um, they worked to get a clinical trial done to show that it could be safe and effective in real human patients and then they got the CE mark around 2009 or so. Um, and that started the concept of using flow diverters alongside open surgery, alongside the coiling. So now you had kind of three, three. three key areas. There are a few other areas as, as well. Um, as with anything, when it comes out, people doctors have high hopes that everything is going to shift to this new technology. So you get these early adopters who start using it 
pioneering it, pushing the boundaries, trying to use it in all sorts of different situations. Typically, when you you get something approved, it's approved for a specified indication. Right. So it was originally indicated for where you can't use coils on, on their own, basically. Um, but the pioneers pushed it into different areas and so on and showed that it could be used in some, some different areas. But then, of course, when you push the boundaries, you, you start to see more complications. It's that sort yeah. of chicken and egg situation. Yeah. You, 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 you find the equilibrium. So what they realized was that these, these early flow diverters, and there are a few different ones around now that various other companies make, um, have some challenges. And the big challenge is because they're weighed, made of uh, woven mesh strands of metal, woven together essentially. So they can get them into position, but typically they don't have enough radial force to hold them in the blood vessels under every situation. So they slip? They can slip out of position. Um, and that's particularly when you get a change in shape of the blood vessel, uh, where a blood vessel may go around a corner. We call it a tortuosity. Um, so under very, very uh, various different situations, the, the flow diverter can either slip or it can distort its shape and not have the flow diverting capabilities that they originally thought it would have. And so often what happens is they will put two or three in. Now these devices are not inexpensive, they cost several thousand uh, dollars, um, and they'll put two or three in to compensate for the one that may not work. So you can imagine that increases the costs, it also increases the time that the, the doctors have to spend putting these in. One typically takes about 40 minutes to an hour, compared to coiling, which can be up to five hours. Um, so, you know, there's, there's trade-offs and, and payoffs. Yeah. Um, but of course, if you're having to put more in, that's more time, it's more theatre time, it's more people time. So all of these costs start yeah. to mount up. So every doctor wants something that works, first time, every time. So how do you do that? People are looking for, for new ways to do things. Is it a magic pill? Nobody's come up with a magic pill. That's some stage in the, in the future. Is it genetic engineering to identify the right genes? at some stage in the future. So we're still at the stage where uh, mechanical intervention with a stent-like structure is, is really the gold standard of, of, of what right. people are looking at. So where our device comes in, it takes the concept uh, of a flow diverter, the stent concept, but it makes it out of a unique design. It's not woven strands of metal anymore, it's essentially taking a tube of a very special alloy called nickel titanium or nitinol, which is used in a wide variety of medical prostheses. And you use a laser machine to cut a very unique design out of it, which is our patent protected design that nobody else has been able to come up with. Um, our inventor, um, who's originally from China and works at Oxford University, got together, uh, so he was an engineer, he got together with one of the world's leading doctors who tr treats brain aneurysms, and um, they came up with the concept of origami engineering for right. the brain. I remember that from, when, um, from our pitch coaching from last fall. Yeah. When we were at, um, we were in Barcelona, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you you came up with the origami origami engineering, and I thought, oh, that's super cool. Yeah. That, that sort of idea, and it, that phrase is just used for your, for your, um, device, right? It, it's a concept we've borrowed from ancient history right, right. to uh, but you've coined to apply, it, that phrase yeah, for your to, device to, yeah. to this because essentially, it's a structure that has a shape when fully formed is going to conform to the blood vessel around where the aneurysm is and have enough radial force along its length to fit and stay in place, right. but also to conform where the shapes are very difficult. And in order to get it in, it has to shrink down. So it has to collapse down into a, a much smaller size to get through that microcatheter 
and be deposited in the blood vessels in the brain and open up literally like a piece of origami. Right. Mm -hmm. I know. And, and I, I saw the photos of it when yeah. you were um, pitching and uh, it's, it's actually, it's amazing. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, it's really, really amazing sort of concept. So when you came into the company, they had already developed the device? Yes. Yeah, so um, they'd got the proof of concept, they'd got the, the fundamental design um, and actually applied um, for some of the patents. The big challenge was, um, so they'd done some preclinical work, they'd shown that it could divert the flow, but the big challenge was now to take this device and refine its design to make it even smaller to fit in that commercially sized microcatheter. And you're, you're talking about something which is 27 hundredths of an inch in diameter on the inside. So you need inside. to make it even smaller. Even smaller. Yeah. And the challenge there is when you make something smaller, which is made out of very thin struts of a, a, a metal alloy, those struts become very, very small. And you start to see the things that you may not have seen when you were doing the bench work. So you start to see things like it can deform and not recover its shape. Um, it can, you try and build it up and make it thick and then it doesn't fit down the microcatheter. So you have to go through a lot of engineering work, computerized modeling, uh, trial and error testing, fatigue testing, a whole host of Which you did. designs and tests. And we've, we've essentially uh, optimized the design, if you like, yeah. over the next year, year and a half. Yeah. Uh, this coming year, year and a half, where you have been doing it? We've, since we spun out, end of 2015, we spun out. And since oh, yeah. that time, we've refined it. OK. So and then uh, end of 2015, you spun out from Oxford. And mm -hmm. um, so what, what funding did, have you gotten going for? Because mm -hmm. we met at the EIT Health. Mm -hmm. Um, it's called Catapult, so they'd identified mm. 14 med tech companies from across Europe mm -hmm. that, that to come and compete to pitch, and they were narrowing it down to seven. So they had med tech, biotech, and digital health yeah. tech. So 14 companies in each of the three categories. You were one of the 14. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. you, we, I coached you in all 14 companies, and you were one of the companies that was selected, mm -hmm. right, to be one of the seven to pitch the final. In order to, it was it, how much money were you pitching for? So we were pitching for around two to to two and a half million pounds right. uh, at that stage. Um, when we'd spun out, we'd raised an initial seed funding of of, of two million, right. and we now needed more to to take us through the rest of our preclinical work and further refinements on on the device. Right. So we were pitching, yeah, for a two to two and a half million. Yeah. And so when you had came to take my course, where were you when once we met, where were you in your business and what our interaction, what sort of mm. effect did it have on? So um, we were at quite a critical phase because um, we were looking at cash out, I think, in the next six months or so. And of mm. course, if you're the CEO of a company, cash is king, you know, You've got to keep it coming in to keep everything going, your development, you know, all your other work, uh, pay the wages, etc. Um, so, you know, my key focus was to raise the next round of funding. And of course, essential to that is being able to pitch effectively to, to investors. Right. Um, and uh, there's a lot that's involved in that. And even though I had pitched successfully um, to gain the seed funding, um, it doesn't necessarily get any easier. You know, you, you, you learn a lot, but there's a lot still still to learn. So mm -hmm. I think going uh, back onto a course to get critiqued and get constructive feedback put me in a much better position going out to seek that remainder of funding that we we required and you and you raised it right? we did yes yeah so uh, yes thank you very much yeah, you're <laughs> my pleasure yeah uh, no it was literally um because i think the final of the eit health forum was in november time i right. think and right. um we were very fortunate we were one of the finalists and i think we came third in the competition so right. we we won a little bit of uh, money which was very helpful right. um but uh, it really helped me to prepare for the subsequent investor pitches that we were lining up. Right. And then it was around just actually just at the end of the uh, last financial year 
um, which is always important for investors mm -hmm. to get the to get the deal done. Um, we managed to raise another two and a half million pounds. Right, end of last year. End of the last financial year. So oh, yes. this calendar year. Yeah. Yes. In, in yeah end of April basically. Yes, so, yeah. right. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. So, yeah. It sounds like my goal <coughs> when I work with, with companies, mm -hmm. founders, is um, to make sure that that every conversation you have about your technology, service, or product mm -hmm. counts so that you understand how to um, create the core of what it is you need to say, the mm -hmm. problem, solution, mm -hmm. market, <coughs> competition, um, your business model, your team, <clears throat> excuse me, your financial projections, <clears throat> the, um, uh, and, the, and then your ask. You know, you, you have to create the core of what it is you need mm -hmm. <clears throat> to put out there, but then you're able to adapt it depending on who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're, you've, you're really good at doing that. You know, it sounds like you've been able to um, understand how to um, adapt your pitch to whomever you're talking to so they understand the value of what it is you're offering. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's always important. Whoever you're sitting in front of, you've got to really see where they're coming from because you, you don't want to waste their time and exactly. you know, they don't want to waste your time. So you've got to try and tune in to, to each other. So, um, you know, often if I'm talking to a potential investor, I'll find out a little bit, get to know them, you know, about their family history or right. their likes or, or, or uh, whatever. Yeah, who's in their portfolio? Yeah, yeah. you know, are they a, a medical expert or right. are they you know, someone just who is very altruistic. Right, um, Phil philanthropy. You know, it, yeah, it, it just depends on, you know, there's a full range you could be talking to. So but yeah. you've got to try and, you know, use the right language to, to meet meet their needs. If, you know, if it's someone who has totally no medical understanding, then you've got to adapt what you're saying to make it understandable exactly. and sell the story. Right. Yeah. So so where are you now with the business? You've got the two and a half million that'll last for a couple of years and you're going to, you're applying, you said, for your CE mark. Yeah. Are you working towards? Yeah. So uh, at the moment, we're doing some final uh, preclinical work to de-risk the project. And this will give us essentially the data that we need uh, to to go out to another pitch with investors to get uh, the final part of the money in, which will take us through a human clinical trial or first in human study uh, in order to get the data required for CMARC to show that the device is safe and effective in humans. And how much money are you going for next? So the next round will be in the order of, of around five million. That's, and you need that's it by when? Think. So that will be t by the end of next year. Uh, oh, end of next year. Yeah, right. so we're looking ahead. Um, but of course, you know, these things don't happen overnight. And I, you know, I think one of the the things that I learned on, on, on the course with, with you that this is a continual process. You know, you're always uh, promoting your business. You're always looking for that next fundraiser. It isn't just in this finite period of time. Right. And, and you never know uh, who you're going to meet who may be in a position to, to help you. We are very fortunate. We've got a great group of investors on board with, within our group now. And, and they do want to follow their money. So, mm -hmm. you know, as long as we keep convincing them with the data that's coming through, right. uh, they will follow their money. Um, but of course, one has to, to look ahead and think, you know, where do you want to take the business? What types of markets are you trying to get into and what regulatory approvals do you have to get through? So um, at some stage, it will be important for us, us to have the right strategic uh, investor who can help with certain markets, whether it be the US, or China, for example. Right. Yeah. So right. we're already thinking about these these important issues. Right. So when you first came to um, my course, mm -hmm. um, you were actually you're very articulate about what you're doing, etc. But what I found, I mean, what what did I, what was our interaction? What how did it help you mm. sort of hone in mm. on your message? Because I know when you first came to me, it was it was not quite clear enough mm -hmm. about what it was you were um, yeah. doing, what was different, the problem, et cetera. Yeah. You know, I think when an entrepreneur or a, or a founder is, is very enthusiastic about what they do, they'll often blind people with science. It's very difficult right. to unpick that. So I think, you know, what you gave me was the ability to, to kind of stand back from that and see it from the other person's perspective mm -hmm. and to distill down what what are the real key elements going on here? You know, 
what are the simple messages about the market? You know, three quarters of a million people with ruptured brain aneurysms every year. What does that mean in terms of people who die? What does it mean in terms of people who will end up permanently disabled? So real headline numbers. Mm. Yeah. What does that mean to society? Okay. What is it about your technology that's different from everything else, you know, out there? And um, what is the journey that you're going to take? How long is it going to take? Right. At which point are you going to be looking at getting a return on investment? And, you know, what do you need? How are you going to value your company? What's the future predicted value? Are there any other examples in the marketplace of, of what others have done in a similar space that you can use as evidence to justify your, your valuation? So I think these sorts of things you, you encouraged me to think about more critically. And I think the other thing was really the order of the story. Uh, so going back and looking at the slides and how they come across. Uh, so that it was a coherent message all the way through, with a strong opening, of course, to yeah. capture the imagination. Right. So, so give me your opening. Well, uh, I think one of the openings that I found is very useful is um, Sharon Stone was walking down the road in 2001. She was a famous actress. She thought that somebody had attacked her and shot her in the head. She collapsed on the floor, was rushed to hospital, um, was actually treated for a ruptured brain aneurysm. So the blood vessels in her, her brain had actually exploded. Um, luckily, she survived, but she spent the next year learning how to walk, to talk, and to remember who she, she was. And during that time of rehabilitation, her family broke down. She lost custody of her children. Um, so, you know, it's that sort of devastating impact on someone who's in the public eye that other people can relate to, you know, a, a young, working, successful, you know, woman uh, whose life is totally devastated by, right. by something like this and has since gone on to do great work with brain aneurysm charities and so on. So I think telling that kind of story really brings it home yeah. to people. Right. Um, right. Typically I'd do that in about 10 seconds, but I just add yeah. a little bit. Yeah, no. But, yeah. Yeah, I know. So you should grab their attention yeah. right at the beginning. Yeah. Because what I tell, I told you, I told many of my clients that, that attention is the only currency that matters. Mm. And if you don't grab their attention, yeah. you don't get the resources, you don't get the meeting, you don't, yeah. you know, they, they can't remember you. That's so, true. so if they're going to, you, you could start out just ex explaining about the stint and the fact that you have um, a smaller stint, you know, yeah. there, there's this many stints and give us some s statistics. Yeah. But this the story that you tell yeah. allows us to remember the sort of the impact of the the devastation of the disease of the of the illness and then you can talk about your solution and what you have and why is it better yeah. and which is what you did well that's yeah. right because yeah. once you've done that they're now interested to learn more about that's it right. but if you start blinding them with technical science you can lose people very 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 quickly, quickly right yeah. so and that's my experience mm. with uh, many of the scientists that I coach is that they it's with blinding them with science I actually mm. hadn't heard that before but that's mm. <laughs> that's a very accurate apropos right. phrase uh, because they give too many details mm. about what's coming and mm -hmm. people don't generally care yeah about. yeah I think it's a it's a lesson that less is more you know when that's you've got a three minutes or five minutes pitch, which sounds, you know, five minutes sounds like a long time, but it, it's not a long time. It goes very quick, but you're you've right. got to get a lot of information in, right. in the in the most optimal way. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. You have to be succinct, right? Yeah. And choose your words and create your script really, really clearly yeah. and be really clear about each, what is, what's the one idea per slide, for instance, that you want people to remember. Mm -hmm. And then you practice it so that you can deliver it in a way that, that makes it not sound like you've already talked about this it's got to 200 sound natural, other times. It? <laughs> yeah. it's, got to, it's got to be like a conversation with the audience that's, that's, exactly that's right. very compelling. Right, yeah. so that you can engage them as if they're... Because in the, with the audience, what, um, you're basically talking to, like you're one person to five or you're one person to 100 or 500, mm -hmm. but they're not listening to you as if you're talking to them mm -hmm. one to 500. Mm -hmm. They feel like you're having a one-to-one -one conversation yeah. Yeah. with every single one of them. That's so right. you, the, your, your voice tone and how you deliver it, your body language, yeah. Yeah. really, really matters. Well, well, you mentioned voice tone. I think one of the things you did quite early on was to see how well people can project their voice. And uh, you did a very interesting exercise getting people to say things in different languages or, or whatever. Right. It was quite amazing, the range, because 
you know, some people, you said, okay, just shout something out, and you, someone would shout, but it didn't sound like they were shouting. No, it was it very didn't. quiet, right? So, yeah. yeah, so I think people don't always, we don't always realise how other people are hearing us. So that was right. a, a great sort of exercise and, and technique to, yeah. to get us to realize how we sound. Yeah. Right. Oh, and it's, a, it's about understanding that when you walk into a room, the burden is on you mm -hmm. um, to make sure people can hear you. And so the, the idea of, I ask people to whisper and then talk it, say it for mm -hmm. one person, say it for 10 people, say it for 25. And what you're referring to is that, mm -hmm. and say it for 50 people. The sentence they would say, would be, they thought they were saying it for 50 people, but it sounds like it's only for 20, mm -hmm. 25. Mm -hmm. So they can't project, right? That's right. And yeah. if you have an, a microphone, you talk as loud as if there's two or three people in the yeah. room. Um, so you wouldn't whisper or you wouldn't blast them super loud. But um, but you need to be aware of, of adjusting yourself and the environment mm -hmm. to suit you, but so that they can hear you. Yeah. Right? That's right. And I, I you know, I think a, a doctor who I, worked with many years ago and we used to run courses together one thing you always said was preparation is everything mm. and um, that's not just preparing your pitch but it's also preparation around the environment so right. if, if you can do some reconnaissance and exactly. find out where you're presenting you know, sometimes you can't and you're just dropped into it but even going to the building that ahead of time right yeah so that you feel more comfortable you feel more familiar in your right, surroundings right and, and you see what the yeah. constraints are yeah and with things that you can yeah change and the things that you can't well, and that's how to right. adapt. Yeah. yeah i remember one uh pitch presentation i had to do uh last year and it was literally um it was it, it, it was as though you were selling yourself in a pit <laughs> surrounded by about 30 people oh. uh, and of course you couldn't face the audience the whole audience at any one time so you had to be comfortable to turn and walk and stand and yes and do that and that was a totally unexpected environment but getting there early meant that myself and our chairman could scope it out for half an hour beforehand and work out uh, how, how we're going to handle right, this right um, right. But yeah, if you were just rushing in straight away. Well, you have yeah. to be able to own the space yeah. and really, really set it up to suit you. Yeah. And then you have to then move with intention. And so if you don't aren't sure, you're going to be awkward and hesitant. Mm. And, you know, they most of what they absorb um, when they're listening to you is your voice tone and your body language. The message is is just a small part of That's it right. yeah. if your voice tone and body language don't support your message mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so with you your voice tone and body language supports your message you know, you're really clear you're confident you know what you're talking mm -hmm. about you you've got this sort of compelling way of talking mm -hmm. so you're it's all um the whole th all of its copacetic it's like all of a, mm -hmm. a whole mm -hmm. so so um people believe what you're saying mm -hmm. and what i find is that um some people, when if they walk into an environment that they haven't sort of scoped out ahead of time mm -hmm. and haven't sort of made their own by adjusting where they're standing and adjusting their voice, etc., mm -hmm. so that people can hear them, mm -hmm. um, if they're not aware of that and they don't act on it, then um, they lose their audience and they're conveying that they're not confident, which means people, yeah. what, what, are, what are venture capitalists really looking for? Mm -hmm. It's not just that you have an amazing technology. Mm. They want to know that you can execute on yeah. your idea. They want to believe in you and your your, your team. And that you can yeah. exactly, uh, and that you yeah. can execute and yeah. you make it happen. That's right. And if you're conveying that you're hesitant or uh, sort of uncomfortable, that's conveying that's yeah. con um, conveying the wrong information. Well, that's right. I think there's a, a, a saying that a a great team can sell an average product, exactly. but a bad team can't sell a fantastic product. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. on that note, well, I want to thank you very much okay. for coming and talking with me today, Mike. It's been really great. Great. You know, and I'm, it sounds like you've just made a lot of progress since last fall. Well, we're, we're trying to. We're keeping going. It's, uh, you know, you've just got to keep optimistic and, and keep working hard and uh, learning all the time. So, uh, yeah, thank you very You're much. You're welcome. It's yeah. been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you.